Okay, can you guys hear me alright? Let me know in the uh, chat and I'll get started. Sorry, I, I had to uh, switch machines today a little bit, so rehooking up some gear to my PC and off of my Mac, so just let me know if you guys can hear everything okay. Unfortunately, I don't have video of myself on this one, so bear with me. How's it going? Thanks again for joining me. This is Tony Linner. Uh, I am a 2D, 3D concept artist uh, based out of Los Angeles and presenting over the Twitch Pixelogics channel for ZBrush Live. Thank you for joining me today. And uh, for those of you who joined me last time around, I kind of went in and uh, did some work uh, on a previous gesture that I was doing, doing to show you, uh, kind of going in the direction of doing something more character driven. Thanks guys, appreciate it. It's still sort of in a concept mesh phase, but uh, I wanted to show you kind of uh, a more worked over uh, sculpt, uh, which is starting to get a little heavier, but I'm gonna try to, uh, over the course of the next month in stream, uh, what I'm gonna try to do is chop a lot of this up and do a lot of retopology and sculpt some of these parts up individually so that you can get a more complex design uh, with a little bit more I guess, uh, visually stimulating bits going on. Uh, there's only a slight bit of uh, kit bash in some of this, like uh, these bags. I think uh, I borrowed a few tiny pieces from a few other kit bashes. Uh, for those that are curious, uh, this one was actually an old one uh, by Kurt Katzman. I'm not sure if it's super available, but it was available through uh, an article that he was in in uh, 3D Artist, I believe, a couple of years ago. And uh, there are in this stream, some special things that I wanted to talk about, especially uh, sculpting up parts of a concept mesh using uh, cloth tools or cloth simulation tools from uh, Marvelous Designer. And uh, I probably will have a look at that file and sort of show you how I set it up. But yeah, for an illustrative purpose, uh, which is usually the mandate, thanks guys, appreciate it. Uh, for the purpose of doing an illustration, I just did some light work and stuff like that, uh, maybe subdivided a few small inserts that I created. Uh, there are a few of you, uh, inserts in this mesh that are of my own device. Uh, I have some kits out there, uh, Gumroad and the like, uh, that I put together, but some of them are super easy and some of them are actually uh, brushes that I think you can pretty much put your hands on uh, pretty easy because they're either inside of ZBrush already that where it ships, uh, and I think uh, married to but want to try out and design so like for example the hands there are sort of a standardized kit of a mech hand that I made a few years back uh, and still in a kit bash and it has multiple poses but I just wanted to sort of proxy something uh, on the mesh and, and get it proportional to the, the gesture and then I split it uh, because 
a lot of times when you guys watch me work, uh, what I'll try to do, hey, how's it going? Sickle brush? What's up, man? Uh, is just put in something uh, for a proxy and then along with my own UI, um, is just using like split unmasked points. Uh, and then so I, I insert and split a lot and then I rename tools so that I can uh, manipulate them later in something like Keyshot. So the list is getting a little bit higher as far as uh, pieces that have been added on, as far as the subtools go. Uh, a lot of these up here were the initial gestures that I was working with. And I think probably last from last week, you guys saw me put together something more like uh, this here. Uh, let's see here. I'll just do dynamic solo on this, and you can see it. So this was my initial sculpt up, um, just to recap of doing a, a character gesture uh, for this Mac guy, sort of like a cyber dude uh, from the future. And I just used like Z spheres and continue those Z spheres out, scaling them, pulling them uh, down until I had something of a proxy. And then I would move to something a little bit more like this posed one here. Uh, and I did this one trying to practice out, maybe just sculpting up a concept of what I wanted uh, posed, so I can see kind of finally later, maybe after I do a straight pose, I may pose it up like this, um, and have him holding something, or something of the sort, but keep all of the high resolution bits that I'm gonna, I, I've sculpted up until now, and that I will probably continue on. And I, I d thought I would give you guys kind of an idea of just um, doing more of the more finalized kind of bits like refinement uh, like say if you take pieces and pluck them out of the geometry uh, and then maybe do some retopology to sort of sculpt it up uh, and how you might pluck apart um, you could use different features uh, like panel looping or um, uh, basically turning into uh, different sections into polygroups uh, and then doing a split hidden and then closing holes in, on the back of those uh, sort of like a trick that I learned from guys like uh, Mike Jensen and also uh, Mike Pavlovich, both, two Mikes, but uh, golden uh, nuggets of knowledge to use. So what I'll do is I'll just like say go back to my original sculpt or gesture, like this guy here, which by now is, is decimated, uh, and I could actually run Z Remesher on a copy of this and get a lot of the topology back, uh, back down or back into a way that could be usable, but because of the mesh getting higher and higher as I kept sculpting, uh, there are some areas that could use some refinement. So I just decimated, and then I'll strip each section and piece out and start working from there when I start to sort of um, either use uh, topology tools or just um, plucking it straight out by polygrouping it and then hiding the, or splitting the rest. Uh, and then giving that some backing so that I can sort of uh, do an extrude from the back and then just sculpt the piece up, right? But at least this way, it's kind of, uh, some, some may call it the, the squishy the squishy method. Like, uh, yeah, yeah, way up. Because, I mean, if, if you look at certain parts like here on the elbow, I'm still going to have to take and do a lot of work to those. And there's some, uh, because of dynameshing, there's maybe some small holes here. But we're going to get rid of all of those. I still have to get in the habit uh, of taking maybe some captures and, and putting them somewhere. I've, I've actually been thinking about uh, taking some overtime for you guys, uh, clips, and saving the videos out. And then if I put them to YouTube, what I'll try to do is maybe uh, put them in YouTube, uh, unregistered link, and then maybe show them in ZVC so that you guys can come and have a look at sort of what I can't explain in the two-hour block that I'm here. So. Ah, uh, yes. You know what? Some, some, I think I got a message from someone mentioning uh, there are folks that are interested in using my color scheme. And I can't remember. I believe I made this color scheme straight off, but I might have modified it from one by Zebro. If you guys are familiar with the guy, he's a South Korean sculptor, I believe. Uh, and the guy's awesome. But if you ever check out his channel on YouTube, I believe he has links to some of his UIs, and I think I modified it uh, and maybe saved it out, and I've been recycling it to various versions. Uh, some of them, sometimes I have to resave it because, you know, 
there are new things that I put in the UI. I use my UI that's almost pretty much stock, uh, just for tabs along the sides, maybe a little bit, but uh, I, don't, I don't have to adjust too much. But every once in a while, you know, you need to come up here and add some things that will give you some extra functionality so that you don't have to go reach into your tablet. But uh, I do, I can say about the colors if you guys are interested in ever getting one. Ah, you want me to turn my mic up? Sorry about that. Give me one second. this. Can you guys hear me a little bit better? Sorry about that. Can you guys hear me good now? Maybe just, just pop me a, a quick message in the chat and I'll say it. Sorry about that. I didn't mean to, uh, I think I was messing around with this a couple of days ago trying to do a stream and it could be a little bit louder. Okay. How about now? Way better? Okay. can even go up just a tad more there we go how's that can you guys hear me good a little better okay more good okay awesome sorry about that so just to recap um, a lot of the things that I wanted to sh tell you guys about is um, how I'm gonna take this and basically strip it down so breaking it into parts and using some really quick uh, methods and tools to just like either separate parts and re-sculpt them uh, using topology. And there's a couple of different ways that I can do that. Uh, why I would do that is to control sort of the design and even expound upon it. Uh, a lot of times what I'll do is I'll take a, a model such as this uh, and then just re-polygroup it uh, into various areas and chunks, right? So if you think of it sort of like a, as a modular system. So yes, uh, using Z-Spheres, uh, also using the topology brush quite a bit, um, and in some cases uh, doing some panel looping uh, to like maybe create like an outer shell. Uh, this part of the gesture that I'm working with, I decimated once, uh, but I could always, you know, re-dynamesh it or turn it back into a dynamesh and get some topology back and then, you know, run Z-Remesher to straighten it out. But for the purposes of just being able to pluck out or copy pieces. Uh, I decimated it uh, for that reason and also to bring it over to Marvelous Designer, which today I was, I think I would give you guys a peek of this. This is sort of um, some of the workflow that I used for the cape. Uh, and for those of you that, uh, I, I might not have that much time to, to talk about Marvelous and how it works with ZBrush uh, that much but I just wanted to sort of show you how the file was set up. So this is a frozen cape, uh, frozen by way of each pattern chunk has been frozen after I've run a simulation. And of course, every time you run a simulation, when you select parts, you can set uh, the shrinkage reft uh, and the shrinkage wrap, as well as changing the uh, pressure and also gravity settings. Uh, setting a default fabric might be also good. Like if you click here on the fabric, you can change some of these fabric settings from different presets like cotton, uh, chiffon, or nylon. A lot of times I go with like a, night, a light nylon for some things that I've been working on. And I've literally just started using uh, Marvelous after quite a while and gotten some really decent results. So uh, if I flip over... Uh, back to uh, ZBrush, I want to, just for the sake of doing like a quick turnaround, say for example, uh, I'll take dynamic off and hide the polygroups there. So this was sort of like the concept as it's been so far, and I think there's some areas that need to really be reworked. Sculpting hands. Uh, one of the things that I do, if I'm working on a human uh, figure or character, a lot of times what I'll do is I'll either put photos of, or photo refs of a human being up and try to get some of the sizing and scaling down, at least proportionally. 
uh, hands are another thing where I would probably start with like say a bass that includes the palm of the hand and then individually do Z spheres that would uh, take into consideration each joint uh, and then working from there. This, uh, for this model, I drew, as I mentioned earlier, uh, here I'll just zoom in on this a little bit. I actually have a set of insert hands uh, that I created some time ago. Uh, and I built these out, I believe, in ZBrush and Maya. I think this was before uh, ZModeler was out, but I built one set of hands uh, and then I rigged it and I posed them all. So I created inserts out of each instance of the pose, so that way every time I need to come back, like say if I want to go uh, turn this off, maybe grab the main body, uh, and go back and find the hands. Yep, there we go. My hands. So I'll turn off the hands, say for example, right? Uh, and then while I'm working on this, this should work because it's only a decimated mesh, yeah? So, in my own brush, I have an insert that has multiple poses, right? So just like flat, or holding something, like a sword or a gun, open-handed and spread-fingered, grasping, knuckled, another shooter with finger forward, open posed yeah so I do something like this and then each time I create it so I can come in and place a hand and now especially because of the fact that we have the widget tool I can just hit like W Y and then change the positioning in the size of this or even the scale I want to give them smaller hands there we go. Gotta make sure these are back on target. There we go. I can flip this, put this inside, just pair it up really nicely, right? And again, this is where a lot of that uh, splitting happens. So I'm just gonna go to the end of my control bar here uh, and split on mass points. So that way, when I turn everything back on, I can work with just like a new set so of hands. And maybe even take one and, you know, press another insert and replace it. Yeah. So I'll do something like that. So they make for a nice proxy, and, and then I'll just eyeball it from there and uh, take it and manipulate it. But if you, if you do click on, if you do happen to pick these up, I believe... Um, hitting shift F, I polygroup them. And so all of the polygroups are maintained uh, from the time that I actually made them, which is quite complex, but uh, you could probably do some auto grouping and then group similar to get rows of them together so that you can manipulate it by using masking uh, and smart mask it and sort of, uh, sort of change the pose even further if you needed to, right? Yeah, yeah, it was, it was a nice idea at the time and it worked, it's worked so I, I should probably make <laughs> a few different hand designs, yeah? But a cool way to do things. There, there's a couple of things also I'm working with cloth that I, I, I will talk about later that uh, doing using inserts that you could probably use them as alphas and all sorts of things. But, uh, yep. Any questions so far? Are you guys following me? So. Uh, let's move on to just speaking of the cape. Uh, there's a cape and then there's also a vest. So these were actually imported into one and then polygrouped. Hence uh, they have different uh, polygroups attached. Oops. Sorry. Uh, undo that. Alt click that. There we go. So this is a little bit dense. Of course I would probably have to retopologize uh, re and project this. I think, because uh, if you put it into a renderer or something, it might not be all that great. But a lot of these pieces, they're, they're sort of a mix between high and low poly stuff. Uh, and maybe I would use uh, uh, dynamic subdiv to see how they preview out. 
So I think I'd subdivided this a little bit and then only uh, sculpted on just like a slight uh, drag wreck alpha uh, once I worked out the inner or the inner you know parts of it. Uh, and there's an inside and an outside to it. So I welded it and brought it in. Uh, you need to sometimes uh, weld your pieces if they're depending on if you add thickness or not. So it's kind of going. The, the patterns are kind of going through the inside. You could change that by probably when you use your brush, uh, going into the modifier of the brush and turning on uh, back face masking, and something like this would not happen. But just for now, we're only viewing the outside that's visible. What is 2D 3D concept? Though? So a lot of times, what I do is to answer that question very specifically. Uh, I will draft things up as a 3D asset to use it in a 2D illustration. Uh, vice versa, I illustrate traditionally by hand, sometimes analog, and also digital. And by scanning and or either digitally drawing something, I will use those as references to create a 3D object, right? So if I need to concept something, uh, you know, using illustration, uh, like a sketch or a thumbnail, uh, or even a more complex design, I will do it by hand and then flush it out using 3D means, uh, using ZBrush uh, and other 3D software packages until I come up with the same shape language uh, and can you know, further manipulate that in Photoshop, just like uh, in a lot of ways the previous presentation where I did some of the cityscapes. A lot of times I'll, I'll do that and sketch it out in 2D and then once I have an idea I'll build 3D objects and then manipulate that as a static 2D image. Right? and therefore flushing out my, my final concept design right? uh, for presenting. Uh, with something like this, why I'm explaining some of this is because uh, after you have a 2D representation of something, in fact, um, let me open up Photoshop and I'll show you guys kind of what came out of this as far as an illustration. Just a sec, just starting this up. Should have opened this before, but I was in a rush to get everything set up. Okay. Let's open up recent. Okay, so this is sort of a presentation file that I made for you guys, and it's just a short JPEG. Uh, from a key shot render but using the tune shaders. Now with something like this, I could go a couple of ways. I actually rendered it with color filled into the objects uh, and only did like a little tiny little bit of brushing for like the LED and sort of like the sharp highlight there. But literally I could take this and either paint over it in sort of like a, a more highly rendered style uh, or I could utilize the line art. And I, I'll show you again how to do that. Uh, because I've done it before uh, in some previous streams and then I did something totally different and didn't use line art uh, but if you wanted to sh set up uh, your ZBrush uh, concepts just to output them as 2D files like 2D drawings there is a way to do that and the workflow for that is actually quite useful if you're not just doing like you know uh, concept design where you need like a character turnaround say for animation or some other purpose but you could also use it for you know comics and illustration uh, yeah thank god Adobe got their uh, splash screen uh, yeah experiments yeah um, but you could use something like this as a 2d line art piece and I'll show you really quick how to do it so once I had something like this laid out and it's just a basic pose, I could actually take and probably you know, do some selections and use the widget tool to pose it out a little bit better and that would be great. But if you just wanted to simply do like a character design so that we could you know, sort of look develop the, the entire sculpt, what I'll do is I'll come over to ZBrush and go into my render tab. And because I have the Keyshot bridge installed that goes to Keyshot 7, uh, I've already got it clicked here. But I'll do another one and just BPR it and that BPR will uh, export all of those pieces uh, labeled and whatnot and put it into a key shot scene.
think I'm going to probably have to do it twice. It puts it in, sets it up, and then we'll start putting some materials on it, and I'll show you how I usually manipulate it. So I'll open the last one, and it'll probably re-import all of my files again, but oh well. There we go. So this is the file that I was working with when I was originally working on the sculpt, and uh, if I turn it around, I just put some you know, very simple, brief uh, materials on it. So if I uh, hit the spacebar, I'll show you some of the properties and how they're set up. But I also need to move this up, full screen it, and view the library. Uh, and one of the things that I start with uh, initially when I get a model in here is I'll go in and I'll hit an environment and set up an environment. So for this, I'm going to actually try something. This is just, I wanted to see it in two ways. One uh, being a way where I give you guys a solid, you know, sort of like a real world material look and then do one in sort of like a flat 2D so for this time I'm just gonna say uh, start changing some elements like um, on the environment I'll just find like an all white background 4k and pop it in uh, and then I'll grab the entire model and I'll put like one simple material on it I'm just going to use the outlined toon shade, I believe. Why am I in all caps? My typing is no good today. None. Zero. Uh, let's view this like this. Outline black, and I'll take it off. Just drop everything on here. I don't want to retain any color or anything like that, so I just need it once. So, if I look on here, uh, here I'll do this. Oh, my machine is kind of chugging a little bit today. Then again, I got a couple of things open. Doing simulations in uh, Marvelous is a little bit hard uh, on the machine. Anyway, uh, if I right click here and edit material, I can come in and start changing a couple of elements. Like uh, one of the first things being the contour width. Uh, I can change this up a little bit higher and that would thicken some of the line and whatever's uh, either a shape or a shadow uh, some of those elements are still in there so it, the line weight would kind of thicken up so between width and angle actually so this is by default is usually like a 30 degree uh, out of a personal preference I set it anywhere between 12 and maybe 16 or something like that uh, and sometimes some of the line weights will literally change so I will click on that 30 degrees turn it into like say 14 and we'll see how it comes out and it's one of those things you kinda have to dabble with because say uh, areas where you have more geometry like say a lot of these have like folds and plus the mesh pattern it starts to get a, a little darkened up so maybe I'll drop it down maybe like to 12 or something like that or higher I think higher the number, the less uh, density you would have. 18. Yep, that's looking a little bit better. 20. There we go. That's not so bad. Uh, and then, so I got that contour there. I'll do 0 0.86 maybe. And that should be good. And shadow strength, uh, sometimes every once in a while, if you're doing some tune shaded stuff that you need the shadows or environment shadows, you can adjust this slider to add shadows into it. For this one, I just want like a flat black 2D line. Uh, and so I'm just gonna use that. And if I full screen it, we can kind of see how it's rendering out. So you can turn it, let it sit for a second. It looks a little bit more clear. And you have an understanding of you know how details are starting to pop out, right? So once I'm happy with this shader, I could probably uh, duplicate it. And I'll hit Shift F to go out of full screen, and I'll 
copy this material by right clicking copy material and I'll just sort of start pasting it in various sections as uh, I need. Uh, I'm gonna paste material as opposed to paste linked material so in other words once you have uh, more than you know if, if any of you are just getting started with Keyshot once you paste a linked material it will be linked uh, and parented to wherever you copied from uh, so I'm not going to do that just right away, I'm just going to paste material in, right? Because uh, I might want to add, add some color a little bit later. So I'll just paste here, and paste here, and paste here. I think I need to go around, and I'll just paste material there, and here, there we go, uh, paste material, there we are, and there are a few small bits at the back, let's zoom in here, and we'll see these, but already you can see it's just shaping up to look almost like if I drew it as a pen drawing. And what I'm going to do is uh, put in a background color so that we can take it uh, into a, an, a total black and white. And yes, you could do paint overs of this, um, but there's a few more steps that I wanted to show you guys so that you can actually do that. On a camera here, I'm actually going to turn off depth of field, which I think I had set up. Let me get it, let me just get it entirely black and white, and then we'll proceed. Actually, oops, copy material from here and paste it here. And I'll paste material here. There we go. And one more for that under the cape is. Now, additionally, if you ever wanted to check some of your uh, design, a lot of these, you know, because the uh, tools are actually broken up. You can actually hit spacebar, go over to scene, uh, and as long as you have the scene tab, you can actually open up your ZBrush model and independently grab uh, specific parts, right? So if you needed to change materials from there. So I'm going to turn this, and I'm going to paste the material here. Oops. Copy that. Paste there. Same for this guy, uh, but I say, for example, if I wanted to disappear this cape, I could just click here on the eye, and see there, there are some other pieces there that have material on them. So I'll do that. There we go. Okay, so if I was going to specifically grab uh, different parts and start changing some colors, like if I uh, grab the scene, yep, and edit the material, I could literally come in and put a specific color in, like a gray shade or anything like that. See what looks good, and further go into each section and put down a color. Uh, for this, I have a white environment, so actually, I wanted to actually use uh, just white alone. Uh, but I chose a background color, and for this, I'm just going to make this all white. Uh, actually, I work independently, uh, self-employed as a freelancer here in LA. Uh, every once in a while I get uh, uh, visual development uh, jobs, uh, and I also teach. Uh, but I'm former to Game Republic in Nagoya, Japan, uh, having worked on a title game uh, such as uh, Majin and the Forsaken Kingdom, uh, as well as Knight's Contract, which is uh, one of the projects that I was involved with. Applicable? Uh, 
as far as like actually building out a concept model and then using it as an, in an illustration I have until uh, recent been teaching for brainstorm if you're familiar with the, the school here in Burbank California and I teach uh, mostly in a, a, like an analog drawing class it's uh, an 83 uh, concept sketching class uh, amongst the company of uh, fine gentlemen John Park and uh, James Paik the Scribble Pass Jews they have a school uh, here in Southern California and uh, teach like a, a concept drawing class. I think that probably a lot of the methods that I used, uh, they could be a, applicable in a couple of different ways. Like uh, I personally do uh, some storyboarding here and there. Uh, concept for games and film uh, would be certainly applicable. Uh, let's say for example you need to, needed to do some iterative design uh, and you wanted to do it from a 3D base. Uh, ZBrush is definitely the tool for that. Um, where you can quickly work out uh, shapes and an idea in only a few short hours and then turn those to line art uh, or output them for, say, you know, anything like, uh, gosh, anything. Uh, 2D illustration, comics, uh, you could use some of these same methods to, to build out models and render them in, say, Keyshot or Marmoset or V-Ray or Arnold or Octane, <laughs> and so forth and so on, and continue doing uh, a lot of Photoshop work to build up your concept and present it, you know, say if you're working with art directors or uh, if you're working with art directors for games, you know, you can put them in Engine, that sort of thing. So a lot of times what, what I'll do is I'll render things out in Keyshot just uh, to do a lot of look development, uh, but I'll also, like, if I need, need to re- sort of do a mesh and put it into more of like a game environment. I, I use Marmoset a lot uh, to do some rendering and stills. Uh, and then I output those sometimes with transparency and then put them into a composition so that I could um, use them uh, like in a photostatic still, right? Uh, District 9, yeah, I'm a big fan of uh, Bloom Comp's work. Love his stuff, yeah. yeah. I would, I would probably say a lot of my influences come from like cyberpunk genre, uh, Japanese manga and anime you know, from years back and so forth, you know, Ghost in the Shell, that sort of thing. But anyway, uh, what I wanted to do is actually take this uh, and just get the material purely white just for a second. Uh, and there was a goal behind this, because if I take this and I let it render for a moment, uh, let's say that's pose one, which I'll, I'll do. And let me go back to the project and I'll turn my cape back on. So you can take something like this and if you click on the actual model, what I'm going to do is actually uh, minimize it again. And now that I have it selected and seen, I'm going to right click it and I'm going to duplicate it. computer. I think I have too much stuff open. Actually, hold on just one second. Uh, I'm going to close Marvelous for just a minute. Sorry about that. This is that that is fun stuff. But anyway, okay. So now I have a copy set up after hitting a right click and duplicate, and you'll notice that we have a world space widget here. And so now I can take this sort of move it aside duplicate it just about so and then this green ring around the outside what I can do is I can take it and rotate it and so I like say for example if from the forward POV or point of view if I wanted to get like sort of a three-quarter view 
I can rotate the model and then just down here at the bottom hit this green check and I can change the orientation of everything in its world space and get an, a different view, right? And so this is how I could illustrate a turnaround, right? Usually like in, in something like production or animation maybe you do a character design and you do it in a, a turnaround so that someone or the client uh, can very specifically you know, have the communicated idea that this is the design of the front, uh, side three quarter, and then maybe back. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually select this guy again and duplicate it. Uh, and then I'm going to tilt it down again move this out and then I'm going to rotate this the other way more towards the back and hit check and so now I have all three guys together with different POVs I'll just move this into center scale it up I think uh, already my image size should probably be at a 1920 by 1080 sort of uh, size but if not I'm just going to check on landscape from the image menu resolution presets landscape uh, and switch it over to 1920 by 1080 uh, some some do and some don't uh, what I'm looking at right now uh, I believe your name is uh, and he and he nepped <laughs> Nepit. I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing your, your name wrong or your moniker wrong, but to answer your last uh, question, yes, uh, no, these don't necessarily need UVs, although it would be very easy to put UVs on this, uh, and UVs is always a thing that I, I kind of uh, tackle with, you know, a few different directions, some within ZBrush and some outside of ZBrush, but um, if you wanted to just do sort of like a simple illustration with, with ZBrush, or rendering, you don't necessarily have to have UVs. In fact, uh, whatever the default UVs of the shape are here, I can just plop a material on it and it would render out uh, not having you know, UV seams necessarily. I think there are probably uh, default global set, uh, UVs set to maybe the object and it's just uh, doing its best to sort of uh, brute force, you know, texture the, the item, right? But if you really wanted to do UVs, uh, that's why kind of I, I would uh, go through what I'm planning to do uh, and that's chop up the model into smaller pieces sculpt those smaller pieces up and then do one entire topology for the entire body and then do sort of a, a projection bake using a comparison method uh, in other words having like a low poly uh, cage for high poly details uh, and then that would be properly cut up so that I could uh, properly bake it and then go to a, a texture application or even within ZBrush, you know, poly paint it, uh, add uh, additional shaders that I would, you know, come up with and then do a rendering either in Keyshot or, uh, or within ZBrush itself uh, or anywhere else, right? Like for, for me personally, like when I do something that's uh, more of like a sort of like game styled asset, I like to texture a lot of my models uh, using um, Quixel. I know some other studios and like to use something like Substance, and you could use those uh, both, uh, or including just you know texturing in Photoshop. Once you have UVs, uh, once you have that you know packed, all of those UVs packed in a one-to-one -one space, or if you're mirrored uh, UVs, you can then take those and of course you know uh, run the gambit with it, right? Uh, that really depends. You know, a concept mesh is really fast, right? So something like this where I could kind of polish it up and, and get it somewhat uh, looking pretty decent for with enough detail. Uh, I think maybe two, three hours uh, doing a character or a complex character. Um, maybe a little bit longer depending. Um, and then, you know, making changes and iterations of, of those and putting them in a row to, you know, so that we can sort of see how it progresses. Uh, and then the work to actually turn it into more of a, a projection. Uh, in fact, actually, you know what? While I'm speaking here, let me just do like a quick uh, render of this. I could I could take a screenshot of this, but I'm just going to use my my render. So just to show you guys uh, a bit of a setup, go in here. 
I'll save it out as maybe like a TIFF and I'm already at 300 DPI. It's not super big. Uh, I'll change my preset going to 1920 by 1080 and so that would be the print size and there's the DPI. Go over to options. I'll do maximum time. We'll do like, let's just do like two minutes, right? Uh, with all eight cores, uh, maybe I'll use my real time settings sometimes, but just for this, I'm just going to use time and I'll go ahead and render it and then it'll save it in the renderings of my Keyshot folder. So I'll render it really quick. And this should be really quick. But back to the question of UVing, uh, yeah, you could use Substance, you could use Quixel, and then once, you know, I uh, put textures on it, you know, I like to use uh, Marmoset as a previewer, or sometimes you can use some of those maps in Keyshot, uh, and, you know, it looks just great. Um, I think probably there might be a little bit of a difference between some of the shaders of the two renderers. They're not exactly the same thing. One is more of a GPU render, and one is uh, more of a CPU render. And so uh, you might you might get some different results, but you would have to plug in all of your maps, of course. Does that answer your question? Probably, I mean, finished out probably anywhere from like a week or two, you know? Like, uh, if you were to do something final, uh, maybe sometimes less, depend it really depends on what your, your deadlines are and, and what your involvement in the project is. Like if I was one guy doing one concept and, and modeling it out, I'd probably give myself about two weeks to do a nice, you know, fully textured model with UVs. Yeah, yeah. So for something like this, uh, you know, I'm just rendering out a quick line art and I'll show you what you can do with it in, in Photoshop. Two minutes is the time. Two minutes I can answer questions. Uh, while that's speaking, actually let's flip back over to our model in ZBrush, right? Uh, one of the methods that I'll probably use, and this kind of goes along with uh, retopology, is I'll select the main body. Oops. There we go. I'll hit dynamic solo, and I'd use something like uh, select lasso, and grab it here at the arms, and hide those. Uh, and then I would do the same for like say the legs All right. and let's say I started working directly on the top of the head so there's a couple of different things one is you can hit B and T and go to your topology brush whoops jittery cursor and I'll make my brush a little bit smaller sorry And you'll notice that symmetry is on, right? And I know that symmetry is on because of transform. Uh, it's going along the x-axis. And what I would do is I would just start drawing uh, directional polyflow lines, I suppose, using the alt to sort of cut off bits that are overage. Sort of like that. This here, this here, and I can cut that later. There we go. Cut here. This is something you kind of have to mess with, but each time you cross these lines with the topology brush, uh, this basically makes a poly face, right? Oops. Let's not cut that piece off. You can cut those two, and I can cut right across here and close that off. And basically what I would end up with is uh, 
sort of like a shell. And the thickness of this would be whatever my brush size is. So if my red cursor brush size, I believe, is smaller, the thickness is actually going to be a little bit smaller. If I bring it up, it's going to be a little bit thicker. Uh, oops. Sometimes some of these don't pair up, so you have to like sort of clear them out and redo them. Uh, but whatever your snap distance is, you should be able to connect the paths or the curves and just keep drawing. And then once they connect, these little green heads will light up. Uh, so I need to fix something to actually close these two polys off, right? So I could do one that way and then cut these. So I just close those, and this is how I get topologic faces along. I uh, I think you know it, I mean of course once you build these skills of course you could uh, build a resume and you know uh, apply at certain places, but um, yeah I'm I'm sure there's a, a certain bit of uh, you know word of mouth uh, that comes along with you know, working professionally. It, it really depends on your experience level and your speed and your portfolio, of course, most of all, right? So putting together a, a great collection of works together uh, to present uh, and the format in which you present your portfolio uh, really can go a long way. Believe me, a strong portfolio uh, will go a long way. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. I wish I could combine some of them myself every once in a while. Um, I, I think, well, you know, it, as they stand independently from each other, like sometimes they're really cool to work with. Like for, it, it really kind of depends on on what you're doing. Like um, if I just wanted this shell, uh, and I wanted to do some really cool stuff with Z Modeler, this is a really great way of just plucking out one section of something. Like, I could have even formed this a little bit better along the contour of that cut line there, uh, and it would be a really interesting shape. But I just wanted to give you guys an example of uh, plucking out you know, Geo or, and or just doing a really quick retopo, you know, sort of like down and dirty. But I'm just going to go ahead and alt-click on the canvas or either model. Oops, actually I did that wrong. I should have just alt-click here. Sorry, it's been a minute since I've used this one.
I should just be able to give it a tap and then we should go. But for some reason it's messing up on me. Anyway, uh, you should be able to just tap on the background, I believe, or either hit Alt and click on the background and it should turn it into geometry, but maybe uh, I did something wrong and I'm being goofy about it. But that being one way to do some things, uh, you know, as far as the topology, the second being, uh, if any of you have not messed with it, uh, it's a bit old school of a way, uh, but you could use the Z-Sphere append method. Uh, there, let me clear this out really quick. Crazy, I don't know why it's not disappearing. Oh, that's bizarre. Anyway, I think uh, I'll just go into stroke and delete the curve function. Maybe I did something wrong somewhere. Uh, but while I have this mesh up, I'll go in a pinned, actually, a Z-sphere. And with a Z-sphere, of course, that Z-sphere has to be on the inside. So I'll turn on transparency. And I'll scroll down to the actual Z-sphere. But I'll show the headpiece that, that I was using. So dynamic solo cannot be on. Uh, I'll shift and click. off. Turning that on. Turn some of the rest of these off. Sorry. Hide everything. Should have been able to just one click hide everything. But I'll just turn it off. Okay. So I'll hit F to frame this up. Now with this <coughs> Z-sphere I have to be yeah, I was, I was all clicking on it for some reason and it was throwing some stuff off. I don't know why. But it, yeah, you should be able to all click on the mesh and it would be able to give you the, the top of But for some reason, my brush was messing up. I don't know why. <laughs> but uh, I'll just put this on the inside. And a lot of times what I like to do is just scale it. And so that way it's a little less visually confusing. But just putting it inside and scaling it down is enough as long as it resides on the inside of the mesh that I'm going to retopologize. And then just going to the outside, uh, making sure it's good, it's cool. Coming down, uh, and I want to open up the adaptive skin and I believe also the topology. Uh, with adaptive skin, I always turn these things down for the density to just one, uh, and then. Uh, I think it's as of R8, you need to make sure, like if you're just doing simple polys, uh, you can turn down the Dynamesh resolution, because not, if, if not, as you get to start previewing your mesh as you lay it out, it will actually make it a Dynamesh resolution so that you can get going using Dynamesh, um, just having a, a topologized Dynamesh block out. Uh, but for this, I just want zero, right? So I'm gonna slide it over. Uh, just a tad. It, it, usually, if you just if you just check uh, something like just the density, which I knocked all the way down to one, uh, and then turn the dynamic resolution to zero, it shouldn't give you any problems. It's just working like like working with just regular old uh, you know straight up you know poly like a poly brush. But so I zoom in here and then I size down my brush a little bit. Hit X to you know be in uh, symmetry because once you start manipulating this or editing the topology uh, if you had symmetry active you might want to keep this open so that you make sure it is because sometimes it'll undo it because it, it, I believe it kind of flips modes so what I'll just do is I'll start clicking in here uh, hitting Q uh, oops Topology is what you gotta click. <laughs> Sorry, I'm being goofy today. Uh, click here, here, and here, uh, here, and here. And you'll notice probably this is an ingon. I'm gonna fix that. Uh, so I'll click here, and I'll actually 
put another poly here. And see, as I go along this expanse of this edge, it is actually sort of previewing where a snapped poly would be. So if I click here, and then I can use uh, the other uh, trans, you know, uh, transpose tools like move uh, to actually move some of these points around, these vertexes around. And so I can sort of fine tune a, a simple topology from this, right? And if I hit Shift F and then hit A, of course, uh, hitting A will give you a preview of the topology. Uh, for this, it's kind of weird because, you know, I should probably work out some topology a little bit better as I'm building this, but uh, that is the skin. You notice that it's just a skin on the outside, and this is the preview of that skin. So hitting A again will go back to your active points that you're laying out. Uh, and of course, <clears throat> After you would be done skinning everything, you would just make adaptive skin. So look for that. In the future, probably I'm going to be using a workflow that uh, records something like that or shows something like that. Uh, but let me let me just work at it for a second, and I'll show you guys. Um, a little bit later, I'll probably record something like this. Let's dash back to Keyshot for a minute because probably two two minutes is up, and I can take this and close it. And so now I have a line art that's clean enough to use in Photoshop for this. So I'm just going to hide this. And I'll put ZBrush aside for a second. And I'll come over here and I'll open. Actually, you know what? Uh, let's see. We're going to save it. I saved it in my Keyshot folder. Cancel this really quick. Usually in the Keyshot folder, uh, resources folder that it gives you, uh, you can open up this file, and it would be in the renderings. So look in your renderings, and you know whatever you have there, which was the last render, will generally be where everything is. So there's the tip that I did. I'll just drag it over to Photoshop and open it. And now I have a piece of line art. Uh, I'm going to use a few tools in which I'm going to flatten this for one. And I'm going to turn this into a grayscale image. So by image, mode, and grayscale. And what now what I can do is I can work directly with the channels. So this gray channel actually I'm going to just for uh, the sake of doing a fill, uh, black and white fill, and that's purely black and white. I'm going to click and reset my uh, foreground background color and the foreground is going to be white, uh, black and the background color is going to be white and I'll explain why in just a second but I'm going to use some actions that I set up uh, for cleaning up line art and then changing them uh, changing them into comics uh, ready kind of illustration like uh, line art so because I draw comics a, a bit on a, in addition to doing like concept or you know visual development stuff, um, I needed uh, an action set where I could automatically clean up line art, right? So post scanning stuff, usually a lot of times when I draw stuff, I scan it, and I, I found that I was doing the same steps over and over again. So like levels, curves, and threshold, basically to prepare stuff for print. So because I have a 300 DPI, fairly highly uh, high resolution uh, image. I can go ahead and run some stuff like this. So that's why I changed this to a grayscale because I'm actually going to run levels, curves, which will clean up some of the line art, uh, some of the dark shadows, and especially if you were to zoom in, there's a lot of gray pixels here. So if I wanted to separate some of these out and just have like purely black line art, I could do that. Uh, so I'm just going to step back here just for a second. There we go and you'll maybe see some of the cleanup changes that happen when I run the action. So first, I'm going to hit post scanning and hit the play button, and there was my cleanup. Just bam, right there, done. And what it did was, the threshold that was run took the strongest pixels in black and basically sort of smoothed it out, and so, you know, it's like a, a, a regular ink drawing right now. There's no shadow, there's no aliasing going on. It's purely just black and white line art, right? 
So now what we need to do is, if I was to add color or do anything else or even maybe redraw some of this, I would need to separate the black line art from the white background, right? And because this is a gray channel here, I can do that. So I just wanted to check mode. I'm working in 8 bits, so that's cool. It's just regular old line art. Uh, I will now go over, and because these thumbnail colors are black, pure black on, on the front, and white on the back, I'm going to run the second part of this action set, which is basically line art, uh, uh, line work uh, masking, right? And separating. So if I click here and just run this, what it did really quick, I'll show you, is just turn my background totally 100% white fill, and it took all of the line art, masked it in quick mask really quick, and gave me a transparent layer from which I have line art on. Right? Yeah, yeah. It's good to set up actions so that you can automate uh, some of your processes and you don't spend time. Because it literally, if I had to do this by hand, which years ago I used to, uh, I think I made this action set back in the days of like Photoshop 7, and it still works. So I just keep tweaking it, you know, in case it has any problems. But uh, it's basically setting a selection, inverting it, setting the quick mask, and, and it basically uses quick mask to. Uh, create a black and white channel uh, from the gray channel uh, and then use the pure black turn that mask into like a inverse selection fill it on a blank layer giving you the line art and then deleting the background automatically and get filling it with white so it's just a pure like black and white you know process where like and a lot of times especially in comics I need to clean up smudges and stuff out of stuff uh, and I got tired of doing it all by hand, so I just came up with a two-step uh, action process to sort of deal with it. And now, you know, I can change the image from mode grayscale over to RGB, uh, and I will not flatten it, and I'll keep it. And there's a couple of different things I can do. Now, a lot of times, like, say, if I was doing something that was stylistically like uh, Japanese manga, for, for example, I've made halftone screens that I can fill in here. But I can also come in and now that it's in RGB mode, you know, make a new layer and start doing some like painted fills or something like that. Uh, let's see. Oops. Can't stand that new smoothing thing. Uh, let's look at uh, crazy brush palette. that off. I'll run this up. Uh, maybe using even transfer or something like that with pen pressure. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, that's good enough. And then I can come in here and I can fill and I can start painting underneath it, right? So good for that. And the great thing is, even if I was to, uh, say, make a mistake, uh, go on the line art, if I didn't lock it, say, uh, and I, say, did something like this and accidentally erased it, uh, this line art layer is just a layer, but in the channels, I have left over the entire line art channel, right? So what you're looking at is actually the fill of this mask. And I can turn that into a selection again, go back to the line art, select black, and sometimes that black for print reasons will be uh, less than 300% fill, and I'll just fill it, and there it is, line works fixed, and then you can lock it back, but you can reuse it, you know, as you see fit, right? So this is kind of one of the great things to do is just, uh, you know, using it for illustration this way, you could use this as a template. So if I wasn't painting it right away, I could do, you know, uh, something like changing the opacity. And I could redraw sections uh, of the design. So let's say if I wanted to add on to the silhouette or something like this, I can sort of sketch out what I wanted. You know, and then come up with 
a, an entire block out for something. And then just redraw the new line art on a different layer. Uh, yes, a lot of times what I'll, I'll do is if I'm doing something like this, I'll do flats first. Uh, and then once I have a flat fill, uh, I'll add shading and volume uh, to render it out. And a lot of times what I'll do uh, otherwise is work uh, sort of a, in a dark to light method, uh, doing working from a very dark gray and building up uh, layers of uh, light. Give them a hat. <laughs> I was thinking it would, you know, it would be, it would be funny uh, to kind of take and make him sort of mohawk. Like I've been wanting to do a mohawk like cyborg character lately. I don't know why. Something wrong with my head. But, uh, oh, the PC keyboard. Yeah, let me see here. I'll pick something. Change this a little bit. A lot of these you can grab like sort of like a pen tool and start sketching in on some of this stuff and then do colors and it looks great. But it, the advantage why some would say, well, why do all of this in ZBrush only to come into Photoshop and start, you know, drawing and painting? Well, uh, the advantage there is that uh, not to really, you know, no, I wouldn't think of it necessarily as, a, as like an artistic cheat or anything, but to really hone quickly because I mean yes we're artists but we're also designers and designers don't have a lot of time because designers have that one factor that you know is money uh, and a clock right and so you need to generate stuff very quickly and you know uh, get it in front of your art director or something and, you know people want to know that you can deliver things on time and for that you know to, to really mess with references and make sure that you have everything down you, know, you just keep, keep in consideration the fact that you know you have to do things in a timely fashion it's, you know whatever you can add to your workflow is is awesome right uh, more efficient is better so taking something like this you know you can rework things in a short amount of time come up with uh, the right amount of perspective uh, and proportion for your character and then just totally rework and redesign things Right. Polishing it off in color and getting it worked up. Yeah, yeah. So, like, I wouldn't really have. I mean, if I had to turn something that was a mechanical design, that could take, uh, you know, hours worth of work time to really, you know, hash out. You know, turning difficult uh, geometry around in your head and then putting that on paper, that can sometimes be difficult right so at least with a method like this uh, it would be a little bit easier to try out I'm gonna get lost for a second and just sketch here for a minute just to show what you can do with something like this but you could totally make a few other head designs or something, uh, change his body. here on the side of his shoulder pads. Hey, what do you know? We got 80s music going, or what they call synth wave these days, and uh, big shoulder pads. Shoulder pads are awesome. <laughs> or at least they were back then. I suppose you could say that. I, it just it, it's it's not so much of a cheat as much of it is uh, sort of 
sort of a, a, a workflow. I, like, I don't think of any, any like, you know, with cheating, the, the cheating doesn't allow for, a, like, happy mistakes or anything like that. All of the interesting things that you could do with a design. As long as you come up with an end result that has a, a challenging bit of uh, form language and composition, I think that those are probably the more important things that I pay attention to, even if I was uh, doing things in sort of a fast-paced manner. Let's do this. settings are gonna are gone a little goofy but I'm just gonna keep drawing so funny in the last couple of days I've been or weeks I've been using my Mac more than my PC and when I use my PC I use it primarily for painting more than drawing so or at, sorry modeling more than painting or drawing and so to reset some of my Wacom settings on my PC. I haven't used it in a, in a hot minute. And I think Photoshop might have lost its settings. Uh, also, here in the brush settings, I'm going to use shape dynamics a little bit. So, you know, you can fine tune your taper. Those pressure settings. I mean, all of this is actually quite small. But... still 300 dpi but I think you guys get the idea behind this you could take something like this and redraw out uh, a sort of hand-drawn delivery of this uh, or add some bits and then you know make those notes you know possible for someone else to view have them go over it and then when you get feedback for something you come back and you know remodel it in uh, which is always great and then you don't have to spend the time modeling over and over again. You can just draw in some details and come up with new uh, changes to your shapes, right? Yeah, I know. Hey, oftentimes enough, like when I'm working in the tube, my, my biggest pet peeve is uh, my fingers are still thinking in Mac mode and I hit the keyboard and it, I mess something up because I, I think I'm hitting the Alt button and I'm really hitting the control or something. Or I have one keyboard for my Mac with uh, you know, after using PC for a minute, I come back and uh, I hit it and it actually disconnects my Bluetooth. <laughs> the, the shortcut that I have in mind disconnects my, my keyboard uh, from my Mac and I have to turn it off and turn it back on. I think there's, there's a step in, in ZBrush uh, using, I think, either Control Z, and I'm thinking Control Z in PC, and I hit it on my Mac Bluetooth keyboard and it somehow disconnects it. So, all kinds of crazy stuff. But, yeah, there are some fun things that I'm going to try to do. Uh, and it's always kind of fun, funny to do those things live because uh, to have you sit through some of it I think would be a, a little bit long so um, uh, I'm still trying to promise you guys uh, maybe a little bit of extra time uh, in something maybe I can put together uh, in an extra video and maybe put that uh, into a post in ZBC 
I've actually been sort of remiss in posting to ZBC. I need to collect up some of the projects that we've been working here in ZBrush Live and put those into a, a collected post on, on ZBrush Central so that you guys can maybe come back and take a look at them. Uh, hit me up and let me know if you guys would like something like that. There's, there's plenty of actually um, extra steps I think I take during the week trying to prep, prep the file for you guys to look at uh, and having talking points on. But there's steps that would otherwise be missed. <laughs> so if you have any questions, again, you know, please feel free to ask me. So yeah, it's kind of one of those crazy things. Like, how does uh, ZBrush relate to you know doing 2D? Well, this is one way. And actually, um, if you were using even your mechanical designs that are quite diffi uh, difficult to do, to draw, uh, and then wanted to do some redraws or um, use them in a paneled instance like a storyboard or use them in a, a comic book or something like that where you're doing inked line, line art over some of those designs, this is definitely a way to do it, that you could do it, and you could do it in Photoshop. Uh, a lot of times even uh, having something like this much I will print this out lightly on a, on a piece of uh, illustration board, um, you know, just using like an office jet. Uh, and this is something that I've been wanting to do in ZBrush Live for a minute is design something in ZBrush, uh, print it out on paper uh, with the opacity turned way down, and then just straight up treat them like, pencil, uh, like a pencil sketch and do like an actual hand inked illustration. You could do something like that and then rescan it and bring, bring it back to a digital environment color it. So I think that a lot of these things are universal. It's just uh, having that connection between your, your different tools uh, and then just coming up with a sort of process in which to sort of carry them through. Yeah. Kind of like being a, a mad scientist. <laughs> you know. Uh, cooking up new methods to see which might be the quickest to get a job uh, or a particular task done. That's certainly worth it. And you could do extra things like uh, take this bag here. Always thought this bag looked too too flat. I actually wanted to make like a, a legging and have that on the outside. So that's probably something in the future that I will probably draw in and then uh, do perhaps in Marmoset. And Marvelous, sorry, Mar uh, Marvelous Designer, not Marmoset, my bad. <laughs> Render it in Marmoset later. have some other cloth bits uh, because those those cloth the cloth sims are really nice to give you some nice folds especially when you come back to ZBrush and you uh, do more additional sculpting you know even if you were doing something like 3d prints or something like that um, it's a really great app to use in conjunction with ZBrush Even if I took a second and while I'm thinking about it. So this is one way I could keep changing and adding details. But if I go back to, uh, oh wait, I closed it. That's right. Sorry about that, I did close it. But it's neither here nor there. I'm just actually gonna pause this just to save some memory. Um, as you know, it's pretty hard on the CPU when it's constantly rendering. So I'm just gonna pause it for a minute and. Maybe that'll cause my machine to be a little bit lighter. Because uh, Keyshot, I believe, is you know like 99% CPU render. Something pretty high. Uh, I don't think it uses much in the way of GPU, but if it does, I could be wrong, but I, I believe it's mostly CPU. And with that, you sometimes want to pause it so that uh, you know, I'm not taxing your CPU strength. I'm actually gonna make this line 
getting smaller. You know what? Actually, let's erase this centerpiece a little bit. I had actually thought about doing this once where having like a more long sort of almost Gundam like uh, centerpiece here that would droop down. Have I ever used Redshift? Uh, I have seen it used and with some really good results. I myself haven't. Uh, I've actually been going more in the direction of using uh, Octane a little bit. So, but I mean, you know, it, it's kind of, I have to really measure how much rendering I'm actually gonna have time for and do, uh, especially if I'm, I'm concepting a lot of my own stuff. So like probably the scale of renders that I would use, I use like BPR is one if I'm working in ZBrush, of course, uh, and then probably after that running into Keyshot because you know from ZBrush to Keyshot is an easy hop, skip, and a jump. Uh, and then if I save out a very complex, you know, uh, arrangements of like a an OBJ or something like a set, and I really want some some finite uh, control, uh, I've been trying to learn to take a lot of uh, my material over to Octane and you know use ZBrush and Octane uh, together to kind of render out some stuff. In fact, that was my, my original goal behind doing some environment pieces uh, not too long ago when I was doing some of the sort of Blade Runner inspired, inspired stuff is to take some of that and plop it down into Octane, but sort of waiting to uh, upgrade my GPU uh, to more of like a 1070, 1080, bit of hardware so that I can render faster. Like right currently, uh, now on my PC I use uh, a GTX 970, uh, which is great, good, you know, pretty pretty good performer for a lot of things, but, you know, new architecture is so much faster uh, for rendering, it's, it's crazy, so. <laughs> what do my kids say about my work? Uh, my kids, uh, my, you know what, my daughter, it, now she's, she's probably, she, she might just be the one, the, the creative one, the super creative one. She's showing signs of having the creative, uh, bone, but my, my son loves it. My oldest boy, he loves it. He, he's always, you know, uh, hey, uh, next time you have to draw this robot. And I'm like, what robot? And he's like, you know, and, he, and then he starts explaining it. He, ha he has some really great ideas, though. Like, my kid is, like, the, the pitch kid. Uh, he gave me this idea. I'm not going to say it on, online, but I'm going to have to draw it and, and create it pretty soon because it was so awesome. But he, he'll say crazy stuff like, you know, Dad, draw some uh, diamond fire robots. And, I, and then I say, okay, well, you know, one time he said, draw the Liminator. And I was like, oh, really? And, you know, he goes through, like, these character development uh, conversations with me, like, you know, Dad, you have to draw the Eliminator. And I was like, well, okay, so what's the Eliminator? And he's like, he has a lemon head. <laughs> and he goes through the whole thing and he, and he describes these characters. And, and it, it sounds innocent enough, you know, it coming from a child, but when you really think about it, it's like, oh man, some of that stuff is really brilliant. You know, I gotta, I gotta write these things down or keep it in my sketchbook or something. You know, so the kids can be a great source of uh, inspiration, you know, for sort of wacky, zany character ideas. My littlest guy, he doesn't, he, he has, he doesn't know what I, what I'm doing sitting here at my computer. <laughs> yeah, I, I really have to mess with his ideas for a diamond fire robot. I don't, I, I really have to find out exactly what a diamond fire robot entails. <laughs> it sounds very 80s. Whatever it is. 
you know, like I could I could think of it as sort of like a heavy metal theme, you know, Diamond Fire Robots, some awesome stuff. was a <laughs> he had one that was really funny um, he called him he called them the Illuminats and I really have to if I can I really have to do something behind that one <laughs> it was too funny the Illuminats So something like this I would probably rough out and once I had my shape I would even redraw it even one more time. Uh, but at least this way I sort of get some ideas of shapes in. Uh, and then I can come back later and either build geometry around this sort of idea or uh, maybe try it again. This foot, foot is a little wonky by comparison to its original, but it's a process of reworking things over and over again until you find some shape language that works for you. I'm just kind of messing around with sketching, but something like that or, I don't know, looking at the line you could something like this and at least you can sort of see and interact with your design and you know pull back I do a lot of like uh, zooming in and out looking at shapes but yeah you could totally ah yes you know so you could probably you know just redraw things, uh, change layers again, maybe pull back some of these and redraw certain parts over again. I would probably grab it like a smaller brush and redraw some details in and then you can add color and then it becomes an actual, you know, solid, more sol solidified design. So uh, I can take some of these colors, fill in some of the silhouette. So I think there's areas of this that I like and dislike, but I'll go ahead and draw some of them in. Plus working from a silhouette is always really good. So you could take like a solid outline shape, whatever you're working on, and totally, you know, add re redone forms on. And then before you know it, it becomes an entirely separate thing. Um, on its own evolutionary path, I suppose. Jocks? Yeah, oh god, it's been years since I've seen that movie. I, I have seen it, <laughs> but it's been a long time. In fact, I think so. I, I just saw somebody post something about like something reminding one of Robojax, uh, I think in conjunction with maybe the Pacific Rim films that are uh, forthcoming, but yeah. The whole saying about, you know, nothing new being done under the sun, well, it I think it, it's it's very true, but it's it's also you know depends on how you identify the idea and the concept and breathing new uh, sort of blends and mixes into things. But yeah, 
It's been done. How do you change it? How do you personalize it? Uh, yes. In fact, I do. Um, I usually keep my shameless promotion to a, a minimum uh, while I'm here on ZBrush Live, but if you're interested in getting some of the action sets that I've created and some of the uh, brushes that I've done and maybe a few other tutorials that I've also generated, um, some of which are free, actually, there, there might be some free content up there. Uh, you can just go to gumroad forward slash Tony Koro, that's T-O-N-I-K-O-R-O, -O, and look me up. I'm also on an art station under the same moniker, and it's usually spelled uh, T-O-N-I-K-O-R-O, -O. and you can look me up. So let me actually come back, now that I've been drawing for a minute, uh, I would probably take a, another pass at the, drawing this whole thing, but something like this is how I would get started uh, drawing something out for 2D, right? And then I would add color to these where I could uh, work in a non-destructive, uh, you know, layer masked way and start doing some color fills that are flat uh, and then doing some rendering on top of that. Um, it, it's kind of like a timely process depending on what I'm building, but once I have a defined shape, then I start reworking things, right? And the cool thing is, is everything, you know, is untouched here. So if I ever needed to go back to my original line art, I could. And everything's still there, right? Uh, let's, let's see, where are we at for time? Alexa! Alexa, turn on the kitchen lights. Alexa, turn on the kitchen light. Okay, we still have about 20 minutes we could go. So let me just go back to ZBrush for a second. And I'll show you guys a few things and you can ask me some questions while I'm working. Uh, few things to cover today, <laughs> all in one go. But, okay. So I'm gonna save this project really quick. Save, save, save. Always remember to save your work. Saving work is good. Even if you have uh, your quick saves set up, if you don't, remember those those finger commands. Command S, Control S, save, save your work. And when you do save, if you're doing something like topology, and I actually saved on purpose because I wanted to do this, uh, remember that if you're working on a Z-Sphere doing a pin method uh, topology, you want to come back and hit edit topology again so that you can go back into clicking polys. And I'll build a part and I'll show you kind of how I get, you know, parts out of it, right? So, uh, I'm going to hit Q. And if I look at my transform, of course, I'm still, you know, with active symmetry on. And I'm just going to click here. try out of this so I'm gonna figure out a way to skip doing a triangle in there so I'll make this a triangle with four points actually uh, my topology is sometimes a little blase but taking a moment to actually learn correct polyflow could be advantageous so I won't warrant against it but uh, I'll leave that up to you guys there's info out there, if you do your research, uh, talking about the ways, different ways of doing topology and like, you know, why you would make topology a certain way. Um, I'm just really thinking about, uh, very quickly, just a general direction of, of shape and poly direction. Nothing specific, right? Uh, one of the things that I also was going to talk about when you're doing something like this, if you wanted to add thickness to your shell, so if you remember on the keyboard I hit A, uh, I can preview the shape, but I can also hit A again and come out of it uh, and add some skin thickness. So let's say if I did uh, 
minus going in towards the mesh, 0 0.005 maybe. I can hit A again, and there would be a little bit of thickness added, so maybe not so small. We'll take a look at that, and so that is a little bit more of a, of a thicker shell. Um, otherwise, if you didn't need to do it just then, right and thin in there, you could always do just the flat skin on that one area, uh, and then use some of the Q mesh features with uh, the Z modeler, which is something I also like to use. But for now, let's just uh, build a section of piece, and we'll we'll figure it out. around a little bit. Uh, a lot of times, yes, I do. Um, there are sometimes some controls that behave a little bit differently within Oops. Ah. Uh, gosh darn it. I accidentally clicked on the wrong subtool. I'm sorry. Go back here. There we go. Nothing's lost. Uh, but yes, uh, a lot of times um, the, the, the increasing need to readily just jump back to Maya has gone down quite a bit, but. Um, it's still a software package that I use, and of course, you know, it has its uses in whole other feature sets that are really great to use. But uh, for a lot of conceptual modeling, a lot of the shapes that I, I get from just being able to hands on sculpt, I can't readily recreate in Maya without taking a lot of time to do it. So, you know, anything that has, like, say, a contour or creating a really quick shell. A lot of those things I can do very quickly without having to uh, go through a lot of effort, um, you know, just using ZBrush alone, which is great. Like that. Uh, I think I'll add another loop up here, center it. Oops. this up here, come up here, come here, and close that, and that could be a nice shell. I don't necessarily need the extra bevel info, I could always work something out differently. Take that, and it has a nice uh, thickness shell behind it. So now I'll just take and uh, do like a topology, uh, and taking a look at the adaptive skin. And so now I can just make an adaptive skin and reappend that skinned version, which you'll see is aptly labeled oops, skin Z sphere. And then once I add it in. I can go back to my Z sphere, and I'll just go ahead and delete uh, the topology. Um, I'll keep the Z sphere, however, 
uh, because now once I have this Z sphere set, I, you know I may want to do other pieces that are modularly connected to all of this to make up the head. So I'll just uh, delete topo, uh, but I'm not going to delete the subtool because I'm, I might come back to it later and use it. So I'll just uncheck edit topology, right? And if you look in the subtool list, I still have this piece that's been newly made for me. Now I can take this uh, and you go B, Z, and start using a Z modeler. And I can add extra loops, of course, or like say uh, an insert. Uh, I can also use something like um, instead of doing like a edge loop around the side or a pan loop, yeah, like an edge loop around the side. I can take and just use this row and set this to like say uh, uh, poly loop. could use uh, extruding for the poly loop. I think that should work. And then it would just take, say, that one and make a nice little bevel inside of there. Uh, and then I could hit the edge and make another bevel. Uh, or I could do, you know, add to curve bevels uh, and shape up things a little bit more. Straight hard lines. Yeah, some of those, you know, you know, if you if you make a straight line and keeping them sharp, a lot of times what I do when I do something like this is constantly viewing things with uh, the dynamic subdiv, because basically when you start subdividing, this is how it's going to look, right? So when I shape up hard shapes, um, I do a lot of uh, creasing, and now versus like back in the day when you had like just ZBrush four or uh, ZBrush 4 or 4 or 5 maybe in and around that time uh, before the Z modeler you just literally had to like go and lasso faces and do a lot of work just to set up your creases now you don't have to do that you can just use dynamic subdiv come in here go along the edge hit crease go to your crease menu uh, and I think uh, Solomon maybe made a, a post a comment about this uh, sometime recently. Somebody mentioned it uh, at Pixelogic, and I think it was when you're doing things with uh, the crease menu, uh, you can kind of set like uh, uh, how much it's going to crease. So uh, geometry, crease menu, and you can set the level. So like sometimes I'll set the level down to like 3, and the tolerance down to say something like 70, or maybe even a slightly tad bit lower. But then I can come in and just say, uh, I'll do it by the edge first, and then I'll do uh, an edge loop. But with something like this, just like these little shapes here, I want to keep these nice and sharp. Crease it. But I don't want them overly sharp. So when I hit uh, D to do dynamic subdiv uh, and perhaps if I turn that dynamic subdivision level up a little bit it'll look a little bit better but I can plan all the surfaces and keep all of those lines sharp by just um, add increasing right yeah yeah four techniques some of those old techniques though they're still very relevant yeah, that's the, that's the thing that I, that I always say like why would you continue to work that way when you could really, you know, just hone the topology? Well, I also get to sculpt a bit more on, on doing some some things the, the in older ways, and that hands-on method I, I do like. But you know, that's that's just a personal preference of mine. <laughs> if I have the time to do it, but yeah, you could totally start to harden up shapes by using a lot of creasing, and. Uh, Depending on the level, so let me just dig up my dynamic step div here really quick. I could change this up. Uh, if I do, like, say, four levels, uh, the actual levels are actually going to be, when, when you hit apply, are going to be five, right? And then you can keep going from there. But this is a good way because, you know, you can't, uh, you can't subdivide something and then put creasing in it to see how it looks. So you need dynamic step div to see how the shapes are ending up. So if I turn the polygroups off, you can see from the creasing how much that crease tolerance is actually uh, putting a nice slight polish on the actual edge. And then I can sort of, you know, mute some of those effects down uh, in 
and then sculpt either in or out uh, some other details, right? But this is one way that I'll start to work, and then just forming up the shape, you know? Okay, any last questions before I end it here at about 6 o'clock? single edge to like edge loop partial or edge loop complete and I'll let that you know run until here because it terminates there there we go uh, Pixelogica ZBrush is already generous enough to give you on the inside bevel that's going on there at the where it takes a planner change at the edge it's already put in for the the inner sort of loop poly loop that goes around the geometry it puts in a crease already so that's at least some of the work already done. Yeah. And then you just come around and you know, sharpen it up. And I think I'll keep this edge. And I'll take one or two out. And you can actually hit Alt and click on an edge and it'll take the crease out of that one specific edge. So like if I didn't need one versus the other, I can just take it out, like this one here, uh, or this one here, All right? And then when I look at it again, it starts getting, in, you know, a lot nicer, a lot smoother. I can even crank a subdivision level up, maybe to five, six, so that would be actually seven subdivision levels. And you can see where it, it creased it. It's actually making a more smooth, uh, molded look to the creasing. Uh, you could use ZBrush to make a base model and then um, continue that on to actually do some topology inside of the ZBrush. Or you could uh, export, you know, decimate and export it out and continue building like proper topology somewhere else like say in another package if you wanted to uh, the choice is purely yours or whatever is more timely to your workflow again but i think probably you could one by one build something like that out of just like insert primitives and then just the z modeler alone like you, you would you would be really surprised to see especially with some of the new boolean features that are inside of r8 uh, you could further increase the design factor of whatever you're sculpting up, but you know general hard surface shapes a lot of them There's a lot of power in just using like say for example uh, I'll go back and turn dynamic subdiv off and I'll just go back to this base uh, here, but using things like um, additional geo EI and hitting some of these primitives there's a lot of power in these primitives, make no mistake. Um, hit M to view them. One of the ones that I use most now is I'm so thankful that Pixelogic included uh, an insert mesh that is a Q cube because off of this Q cube, like I can actually add a, a piece of geo, split it really quickly, and then start shaping up that individual piece of geometry and come up with some wild things. Uh, and if need be, turn it into you know Dynamesh uh, and still sculpt faster. Um, and then redynameshing that and reshaping it uh, and retooling it for what I need. Uh, and then later, you know, using um, either Z Remesher or like topology tools to get the topo back in order. And then I can take those parts and export them someplace else, Maya, what have you, uh, and further go at it a little bit more, adding detail, you know, or not if you don't need Maya. Uh, a lot of those functions and um, features can pretty much be done inside of ZBrush these days. Uh, and Z, Z Modeler is such a powerful tool, you know, like even if I was to take, um, say certain edges, you know, you can do a lot of beveling and stuff and chamfering uh, of different topology, like right off the bat. Um, I like to use the Z Sphere pin method to like basically create a shell of some shape language and anything that I'm building. 
and then use either boolean or insert uh, stuff to further take that along and reshape it. Like, um, you know, say this, this cylinder extend here, like I'll take it and I'll draw it into something. Uh, that looks like it's along its plane. I can hit W and make, see how far it kind of goes through a mesh. And if it goes all the way through, uh, fairly clean, just for example's sake, I'll do something like this and turn it, right? And then I'll just split it. And as I have a split, it is here. And then I'll go over to render render booleans, live booleans. I can make this a start group and change this to a negative and very quickly start to see, you know, results about um, how something is, you know, cutting out of another object. Actually, it looks a little weird on, on this one, but that's probably because I have polygroups on it. Sorry. And I'm showing the other gesture. So if I turn it off, it looks like that, right? And I can make new new geo, you know, doing like a really quick boolean. Uh, and I can use the widget, which is, you know, super cool. Always handy to have that. Let's slide this down. And it doesn't always have to cut through. It can also just go through part of the surface. And I can put some details in there, or you know, use some other kit bash pieces that. Uh, that I've, I've cooked up or something like that. Something within, you know, the visual taste or visual language of what I wanted to build and what, what I actually, the style that I work in. Uh, but something like this, you can actually just go and go to the Boolean menu here and just make Boolean mesh, which will make a union mesh that you can append back into your design, right? So if I make Boolean mesh, and then pinned it back. Boom, there it is. And it'll say this U mesh here. Uh, let me frame it up again. There we go. Frame. There we go. So if I turn this, and that's what the geo looked like. It actually did a little bit of triangulation to, you know, in its calculation to put that shape through and cut it out. But you could always change this into a Dynamesh, uh, something really high resolution, and then uh, frame it by curves, and then do like a Z remesh or something like that. It's really nice. So it's just kind of like a, a really quick way to build some shapes, yeah? Using uh, inserts and uh, Boolean, uh, along with retopology methods. Just, it's all shape, right? Yeah, sure. I'll check it out. Okay guys, it is the top of the hour and I don't want to take too long in case somebody's coming right after me, but uh, thanks for joining me today. I appreciate it and uh, I'm going to try to continue to record some other bits and see if I can uh, compress them down and put them up for you guys because I know I've been pressed for time trying to put that together for you. Uh, and then there's some other things that I've wanted to show you, but I just didn't want to have you guys sit entirely uh, in a two-hour block just to watch it live. <laughs> we might figure out a couple of other ways to have it go through uh, ZBrush Central and maybe we can share some extra material with you because uh, some of this stuff is really really cool but it gets a little bit lengthy to explain so I want to give you guys a little bit of a break but thanks for joining me again and yes I will be back uh, I think I have one other date in February that I'm gonna uh, probably week after next I think is, is probably my, my date to come back so same bat time same bat channel on Saturday uh, probably from 4 to 6 I'll be here uh, not this coming weekend, but probably weekend after next, I believe, is my date. Alrighty, guys. Uh, otherwise, stay tuned for the calendar. You can always look there, and I think uh, Kyle over at Pixelogic will probably work out scheduling or, you know, uh, make it public so you guys can check it out and tune back in. Okie doke. Thanks again. Everybody have a great weekend. Uh, enjoy. And I'll see you next time. Thanks again to Pixelogic. And for Twitch, thanks. Have a good one, guys. Thanks for joining.